There are a lot of people within Shell that regard the game changer individuals as hobby horsing. You know, they they just, they don't see the practical value there. They they're they're not you know they're you know the tens of thousands of technical professionals at Shell. Very few actually end up deeply exposed to sort of the, the successful game changing projects. And so what they see is a lot of people doing crazy stuff. And and I've heard in many from many smart, otherwise um, constructive and and open-minded people referring to it as hobby horsing within the game changer group. And that just means they don't understand the they don't understand the concept of game changer. It's not about not understanding what projects they're looking at. They don't even understand the, the whole concept of what game changer is trying to do. Yeah, it was remarkable uh, how many things we had in the portfolio. I think it was like 30% or so of what we then considered to be the regular portfolio actually started in game changer, but people forgot about it. And uh, so you have to advocate a little bit on, you know, make that link. And because if you, if you can't demonstrate that you have impact, you know, this, you will lose your case. And this is one of the problems of game changers, a lot of tweaking rather than looking at new effects and saying, right, but you know, the, it's game changer in that respect is simply a reflection of, 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 the, of, of Shell at large. And how to identify? Well, you need to have. That's why. Remember, I said you know, Shell is happy. That's the whole point. They don't care. They always have to have a few people there with some expertise who will, who are interested in certain things that they can bring out when the time is right. But that's a very very small number now, and uh, and they're pretty alienated from Shell. What we felt with Game Changer is that. Uh, it's important to uh, democratize uh, the innovation process because innovation is about it starts with ideas, new concepts, and and uh, and so the feeling was that uh, um, there are more brains at the bottom of the organization than there are at the top. So how do you get access? And and it's not necessarily inferior brains, of course. Eh? <laughs> so so how do you mobilize the uh, the uh, the thoughts? And, and ideas that, that, that live in, uh, in the minds of 100,000 people, rather than the ideas that live in the minds of 100 people. The speed of innovation things happen nowadays, it's just, it's, it's, it's so high that, that, that if you don't kind of set up your organization to operate at that pace, you know, as a consequence, you know, the future will walk away from you uh, at, at, at enormous speed. We simply got to find uh, better ways to find and connect and collaborate with people and, and uh, develop their ideas. People should be introduced to Game Changer um, in, uh, at the very earliest contact when they make make up when they have their first experiences at work because that's where the the shock happens that what is this they come from either from uh, from university or from another company with other habits and other technologies and it's in the in the wonder or the shock that uh, that uh, that new ideas are born and it's those people that you want to to grab. The one thing you can take from it is the idea of having a, an idea and then somebody else building it and modifying it to be more realistic. I think there you can, in terms of, in, in the social media, not necessarily in things like video conferences, you could have a more in house like discussion that might not be possible because the person who knows about it is just not available. And so with the modern technologies, yes, you could have more interaction with people who you then I mean, you know, it's difficult to meet like-minded people very often, and it's, you've got a better chance if you have it through the technology. I think that the Game Changer 3.0 thing is not just about outside, it's about inside touching outside and outside touching inside, and it's the whole, it's, it's it somehow involves even within side shell um, groups and networks of people much bigger than, the, than a core little team sitting in corporate offices. It's how do we uh, tap um, uh, larger people, but I, I, I think, for example, one way to, to enhance that interface is, you know, maybe one of the essential mechanisms of a Game Changer 3.0 is a, a system that allows uh, us to support 
um, people with passion and interest, you know, the potential peer wax to go, whether it's lie under the stars or go live and work in another industry for six months or something. Contract all the research at universities and say, look, you know, we're going to give you so much money and you just uh, be available for us when we need you. And, and you know, here is your, what's it called? A re retention fee. You have a retention fee if and when the time comes, but in the meantime, we'll keep you going as a resource that, that we, uh, yeah, that, that's what they should do. It's the old story. If you keep doing what you've been doing, you're going to keep getting what you've been getting. And what we've been doing for, for decades with universities and research is basically just throwing money over the fence. Um, the idea is that the, the, the mental model, within Shell at least, was that university faculty do what they want. They're sort of independent practitioners. You, 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 you give them money. They need money, so they love you for that. And uh, you might be able to, to shape what they do a little bit, and, and hopefully some little gem comes out of it. One big change, of course, between then and, and now is the access to people outside the company. It's much easier now than it was then. Also, for two reasons. First of all, you have the media to do it now, and, and uh, which really did not... I mean, they existed, but they were pretty clumsy in those days. Uh, but also, the, uh, the mindset of the company changed. Is that, you know, Shell went through a change from... I remember, you know, when I joined Shell about 20 years ago, um, you know, people told me literally, he said, you know, if it's important for the company, we do it ourselves. Yeah, so, so don't mess around with external parties. It's just a whole load of red tape and bureaucracy and the, forget about it. And now it's open innovation. You almost have to say, you know, hey, why do, why do I do it? Why don't I leave it to somebody else? So, it's, so, so there is, the company is much more receptive for it now than it was then as well. Jack Wells says, in response to the interviewer, what's the one thing we need more than anything? Jack said, nuts with ideas. And I absolutely agree with that. And frankly, I think that there's a lot of nuts with ideas, and I use the word affectionately. Um, and and uh, I, I run into um, people with ideas just, uh, they're everywhere. And, and what they're looking for is people that are willing to work with them to help them develop uh, their ideas. And um, uh, again, I think we're, as Game Changer, we're still scratching the tip of that iceberg. I think the, the, those, those people with ideas, um, uh, a thousand heretics, they exist in, in energy, they exist in medicine, they exist in any field of scientific endeavor for sure, but also in non-scientific fields. And I think the process of learning how to tap and work uh, with those, those uh, people is uh, the, the essence of, of innovation in, uh, in, in the future. In this old world, the deliverable is, is exactly what I write down with the accompanying quarterly reports and budget statements and all the rest. In the new world, the deliverable is an intellectual partnership where there's this open sharing of ideas about what, what's important and how the business works and how universities work and, and what direction research is going. And that's, that's where the potential is to me and that's where the content game changer is in my mind. I think the challenge um, of taking something that looks attractive and then turning it into something real is very often way underestimated by most, most people. Uh, it's much harder than it looks. In fact, it's so hard that if people knew how hard it was before they started, I think more people would not try it. <laughs> Another very important um, aspect of, uh, of innovation, I think, and again that's illustrated with, uh, with superstars like Steve Jobs, is that um, uh, you, you need to, uh, to keep the, the right people uh, involved. It's, I don't believe, and that's again what you hear typically from these uh, VC mind of thinking or from, uh, is, is that, yeah, well, the innovator is the creative guy and he's good at starting things up, uh, but he's typically not the right person to take it further. But um, uh, so I believe that Precisely the, the sort of coaching that Game Changer has been giving myself and no, and no doubt also others is very much making the, 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 the proponent an, an intrapreneur 
who is aware of um, of the commercial aspects of uh, yeah, creating value and it happens by just working the system working the the, the community um, and as you develop those skills um, I feel that uh, I've I've gained enough experience and skills in, in uh, to take it quite a bit further into into product development well I think uh one of the things is give game changers, individual game changers, uh, less projects and tell them your job is to take the idea and help nurture it from its development and avoid people having like, Roy, my student is standing over there. No, it's, just to, <laughs> it's to take the idea and develop it and turn it and help nurture it and not just go through a process of saying, when's the next call game? And to take an interest in the results and say, well, you know, and, and instead of saying, you go and talk to somebody in commerce, let us go together and the game changer will be my nanny and I will be the child and he's presenting the child with his potential but every little child needs a nanny to take him when he's being interviewed for the next stage of his educational development and to say, you know, and then you've got a bit of authority that the game changers I said, but then you, st you, you, you stumble on the essential problem in Shell and the essential problem is that the people you're talking, taking to in the business are, uh, are not taken seriously so what Peter Fawcett needs to do is he needs to say, make game changer bigger more powerful and he needs to say to them right to everyone in the business you are required to show that you have taken on some proposal from game changer which they think is appropriate and your bonus depends on on the large your division having taken on and then the managers will cascade that down and say what have we done and you know and the man and the, the managers concerned will know that their bonuses depend on it I have to say that is why I don't do game changers now. So I do them a lot less. I've got another source of funding, and actually I'm going to slide back and say, well, you know, I, it's not my job. I don't have to go through for game changers. If all I get are things that are, well, what's your business plan and what's the financial value? That is not. I am not an economist, and it's all bullshit anyway. They should send get a technical economist in to do that to decide it's worth it. My thing is to come up with technical innovations, but that's a general problem in the 21st century, and it has been. I've thought this since. I started in Shell is that we're now past the peak. There's no longer interest. There's been a loss of failure, loss of faith, even in the biosciences, that technology can deliver improvements. And that is the fundamental problem that Shell's up against. You know, how do you want to manage research? You go to a place, you go to a university where what the business model is sort of mad scientists, right? And, and you immediately constrain them with a very tightly written research agreement with a list of deliverables. Well, how much sense does that make? Not a lot. It, it, you know what that does, and this is a mistake. I think this is this grew out of out of the evolution of of the oil company research labs through the 80s and 90s. As they cut back, as your comment was the 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 research business became more customer focused. The internal customer, the operating oil and gas field, the operating companies, and. Um, in the 90s, all of a sudden, all of Shell's research labs had to deliver value and to, the, to these customers, and they were measured and graded on, on how well they did that. And, and they also had to, to be self-funding, you know, sort of internal money moving back and forth. So everybody sort of had to pay for themselves by doing work for, for the operating companies. That's all fine. That's, that's great. But that's about technology deployment. It's not about research. So the reaction was... Well, we can still access research. We'll, we'll go out to universities. But as soon as, you, as soon as you try to access research by going out to universities and you, you structure these very narrow research agreements with long lists of deliverables and quarterly, sometimes monthly or biweekly budget reports, which just drive faculty nuts, as soon as you do that, you're not treating the university like a research uh, entity, you're treating the university like an extension, a direct extension of your technology deployment organization. Basically, should either be really good people doing totally fundamental research, plus people doing more oriented, application oriented stuff, which I'm certainly more interested in. When I look at the university, and I'm at a technical university, I, I, my heart sinks when I see totally fucking useless projects that people are doing. And but part of the problem for that lies with the industry because they have, there's a mutual disconnect because that industry, the academics think only have their pet area and are not willing to diversify into other areas. I think I've shown by my track record that I've diversified into many areas, but there's also a problem on the failure of industry to 
pick up when there is an application. You have to go connect with that community in a way that, that encourages them to, to bring ideas forward and, and, and toss something out to you. And, and that's where the relationship matters. Uh, isn't that a bit chaotic? And I said, yeah, it's, it, it is a bit, it's chaotic by design. And, and uh, my metaphor was, it's like turbulent flow in a pipeline, you know? So, so you as the CEO need to be very explicit about what you see as the boundary conditions. And then within the boundary conditions, you should, you should forget about it, you know, and, and let that chaos happen. And so if as a company you say, well, you know, we for whatever reason are never going into, let's say, nuclear energy, you know? Then it's clear that we should not have any, you know, we should not promote any ideas around nuclear. Just forget about it. But but so it's so some high level guidance I think uh, helps. But if you want to promote, um, yeah, new thoughts, then you shouldn't mess around too much and, and and let it let it happen. Part of the recipe for success in exploring new space is you know letting the voyages be voyages. You know, wave goodbye at the dock and be prepared when they do come back. But meanwhile, um, go about your daily business. Past experience tends to indicate that setting up a system encourages an emphasis on process, and process kills everything, as we know. Um, and I think this is inherent to the nature of large organizations and will never change. Uh, you, you can't get around that one. And, and all the change management, as it's called, in, yeah, actually contradicts you in terms of change management. Innovation will always be there, it's, it's human nature and that's why the, the, the innovation and control are, are, are really opposing to each other. Innovation is change by definition. Innovation means you're going to do something else than how you do it today and that is change. I mean you can have a whole long debate on that but innovation is change by definition. And if you live in a world where you want to have absolute control you have killed off innovation. And because that will never happen, people will always find ways around to innovate. So you better, get, you know, you better realize that that control is, is a fiction. At the moment, uh, what you see is, I think that, uh, that people may have an excuse, is that, well, you know, there is, uh, there is uh, so much work, I don't have the time to be engaged in this stuff. You know, and my boss and the boss of my boss probably puts more reward into what they see as their key deliverables as, a, as opposed to be, being, uh, how do you say that, engaged in some sort of a step-out technology that nobody asked for. So that's maybe something that uh, maybe you need to incentivize that again, you know, so somehow. I don't know exactly, there are many ways to do that, but, but, but uh, somehow you need to make space for this, Is that, that, that it's okay for people to be engaged. From, from the top down, there is uh, frustration at how slow the whole innovation funnel works. But they must basically do it unto themselves. Uh, so by, uh, by, by not having the right uh, funding and, and, and reporting uh, mechanism in place to, um, to scale up quickly the, the next big thing. How do we prevent the process to become, the game changer process to become a shell process? And, and so how do we keep it fresh and, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, how long should people stay? And that, that is something that worries me a little bit in the current process is that uh, I think that we, you know, when we started it, we had the feeling that, you know, you cannot do this longer than maybe two years. So you, you, you get in, you're fresh, you get exposed to new thoughts, new connects and stuff like that. And, uh, but after two years, you know, you run the risk that you become a bit stale. And that the, the innovation process, we, which we thought was more a bottom-up process, becomes part of the establishment, so to say. Yeah, that would that it would make sense if if that was presented as part of the of, of the big redesign. That um, yeah, you would require at least somebody. Voters should require somebody who's uh, who's done some major innovation himself as a some point in their career or perhaps even before getting to Shell but they must know what it really takes that that would make the whole organization much more effective
I would challenge the team and ask them, so, uh, you know, what else could you do? And, and, and I think still building on, to some degree, on the same principles, you know, and the principles are, uh, there are a lot of people at, let's say, at the bottom of the company, and there are a few at the top, so, so tap into, you know, the, the, the large population there, and tap into a large population outside the company, now more than in the past. And, and, uh, and on, on, on those principles, basically, try to reinvent yourself.